All right, guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous, and I do mean over the top beautiful. It is a Sunday morning here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. It is a just a postcard picture perfect day on the planet here at Bugs in a Jar. On uh, where are we? We are already to Sunday, October 9th. So, uh, being Sunday, it is time for my weekly doomsday sermon, and I'm going to bring you a sermon <coughs> from someone I have never surprisingly brought you a sermon from before. And that is maybe we have a new writer in the doomsphere. This is none other. This is from The Guardian. Thank all my alert, all my alert uh, listeners sending this to me from none other a full out rant sermon none other than Greta Thunberg alright Greta Thunberg has now taken up the pen which I guess is mightier than the sword and uh, I'm thinking that Greta might be worried that she's being upseated is that the word? overthrown by this new doomer chick named Julia. I don't know if you saw that clip. I played it here last week. Julia from Just Stop Oil is uh, could be could be gaining on Saint Greta. So Greta is not going to let Julia become the new head Karen of the Doomosphere. So she's going to pull out all the punches in this, well, not all the punches, obviously, Greta is, is saving one punch. And uh, that, of course, is the O word. Uh, <clears throat> you will not see the word overpopulation, population, anything. Greta will uh, never mention the word overpopulation. I don't know if she's ever breathed the word. So the day that Greta tells her little, uh, like, is she still a teenager, tells the youngsters to stop breeding, she will not be an official Doomer chick. But she's getting there. She's getting so close. She understands the climate part. What she does not understand, what Greta Thunberg, like 98% of the, lefties do not understand, and maybe Book Hermit can explain that to, to Greta that climate change, whatever you want to call it, is one of the nine planetary boundaries. Climate change is one symptom of overshoot, and overshoot is a combination of overpopulation and overconsumption equals overshoot. And climate is one subset of overshoot. And without climate change, makes no difference. This planet would collapse with no help from the climate crisis. But anyway, we're going to turn this over to St. Greta. I will try not to interrupt her Karen harangue many times. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to put the link on here, guys, and you should just go read this yourself. But if you want to hear some crusty old doomer, read it for you. I can't think of a better way to spend this gorgeous Sunday morning. All right, take it away from the Guardian. Greta Thunberg! On the climate delusion, there we go, it is now the climate delusion, quote, We have been greenwashed out of our senses. It's time to stand our ground. Yes. Governments may say they're doing all they can to halt the climate crisis. Don't fall for it then we might still have time to turn things around. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So, Greta Thunberg still clinging to the hopium that we are going to turn this freight train around. Anyway, 
explain why you think it's not too late. St. Greta. <clears throat> Maybe it's the name that is the problem. Climate change. It doesn't sound that bad. The word change resonates quite pleasantly in our restless world, no matter how fortunate we are. There is always room for the appealing possibility of improvement. Then there is the climate part. Again, it does not sound so bad. If you live in many of the high emitting nations of the global north, the idea of a changing climate could well be interpreted as the very opposite of scary and dangerous. A changing world, a warming planet, what's not to like? <clears throat> Perhaps that is partly why so many people still think of climate change as a slow, linear, and even rather harmless process, but the climate is not just changing, it is destabilizing, it is breaking down. The delicately balanced natural patterns and cycles that are a vital part of the systems that sustain life on Earth are being disrupted, and the consequences could be catastrophic. Because there are negative tipping points, points of no return, hmm. and we do not know exactly when we might cross them. According to Manga Bay, where are we? Uh, we crossed, is it four, five, or six of them? <clears throat> what we do know, however, is that the they, meaning the tipping points, are getting awfully close. Even the really big ones. That was a chippy point. I think we have lost. Would you get that chipping point, please? He is off. Sancho Panza looks like his leg has recovered. Anyway, so much for the dog. <clears throat> yes, what we do know, however, is that the tipping points are getting awfully close, even the really big ones. Transformation often starts slowly, but then it begins to accelerate. Can you call, say, the snowball to hell? The German oceanographer and climatologist Steven Romstorff writes, quote, We have enough ice on Earth to raise sea levels by 65 meters. That's about 200 feet, about the height of a 20-story building. And at the end of the last ice age, sea levels rose by 120 meters as a result of about 5C of warning. Close quote. Taken together, these figures give us a perspective on the powers we are dealing with. Sea level rise will not remain a question of centimeters for very long. The Greenland ice sheet is melting, as are the doomsday glaciers of West Antarctica. Recent reports have stated that the tipping points for these two events have already been passed. Other reports say they are imminent. That means we might already have inflicted so much built-in warming that the melting process can no longer be stopped or that we are very close to that point. Either way, we must do everything in our power to stop this process. Yes, we must do everything in our power to stop this process because once that invisible line has been crossed, there might be, there might be no going back. We can slow it down, but once the snowball has been set into motion, it will just keep going. Mm. This is the new normal is a phrase we often hear when the rapid changes in our daily weather patterns, wildfires, hurricanes, heat waves, floods, storms, droughts, and so on are being discussed. 
these weather events are not just increasing in frequency. They are becoming more and more extreme. The weather seems to be on steroids and natural disasters, natural disasters increasingly appear less and less natural. But this is not the new normal. What we are seeing now is only the very beginning of a changing climate caused by human emissions of greenhouse gases. Until now, Earth's natural systems have been acting as a shock absorber, smoothing out this dramatic transformation, <clears throat> these dramatic transformations that are taking place. But the planetary resilience that has been so vital to us will not last forever. And the evidence seems to suggest more and more clearly that we are entering a new era of more dramatic change. Climate change has become a crisis sooner than expected. So many of the researchers I've spoken to have said that they were shocked to witness how quickly it is escalating. But since science is very cautious when it comes to making predictions, maybe this should not come as a big surprise. One result of this, however, is that very few people actually knew how to react when the signs started becoming obvious in recent years, and fewer still had planned how to communicate what is happening. It seems like the vast majority of people were preparing for a different, less urgent scenario, a crisis that would take place many decades into the future, and yet, here we are. The climate and ecological crisis is not happening in some faraway future. It's happening right here and right now. <clears throat> and I think that little and ecological crisis is the only time that Greta, you know, kind of makes a veiled reference to the other eight planetary boundaries and other 500 tipping points and e the climate and ecological crisis. Okay, Greta, the climate crisis is one subset of the ecological crisis. It is not a climate crisis and an ecological crisis. It is an ecological crisis including the climate crisis with one cause, or shall we say, eight billion causes, although you will never mention the one to eight billion causes of the ecological crisis, cause you do not understand that they're one and the same. But anyway, I need to get back <clears throat> to Greta. If everyone lived like we do in Sweden, we would need the resources of 4.2 planets to sustain us. And the climate target set in the Paris Agreement would be but a very distant memory, a threshold that, that we would have crossed many, many years ago. The fact that three billion people individually use less energy on an annual per capita basis than a standard American refrigerator gives you an idea of how far away from global equity and climate justice we currently are. The climate crisis is not something that we have created the worldview that largely dominates the perspective from Stockholm, Berlin, London, Madrid, New York, Toronto, LA, Sydney, or Auckland is not so prevalent in Mumbai, Gurlamud, 
Manila, Nairobi, Lagos, Lima, or Santiago, Santiago, people from the parts of the world that are most responsible for this climate crisis must realize that other perspectives do exist and they have to start listening to them because when it comes, ah, okay, when it comes to the climate and ecological crisis, just like most other issues, many people living in rich economies still act as if they rule the world. I hate to say it, gratis, because they do still rule the world. Anyway, that's why they act like it. <clears throat> By using up the remains of our carbon budgets, the maximum amount of CO2 we can collectively emit to give the world a 67% chance of staying below one and a half C of global temperature rise. Uh, the global north is stealing the future as well as the present. It is stealing not only from its own children, but above all from those who live in the most affected parts of the world, many of whom are yet to build much of the most basic modern infrastructure that others take for granted, and still this deeply immoral theft does not even exist in the discourse of the so-called developed world. Okay guys, obviously I cannot let this moronic comment that uh, something about a 67% chance of staying below one and a half uh, degree C. Guys, there is a zero percent chance of staying below the one and a half C target. I can't believe that Greta Thunberg of all people spouting this unadulterated horse shit. 67, what? you know, come on girl, grow up. I anyway, for Greta Thunberg to act like uh, there is a one percent chance uh, of us staying below one and a half C. Good Lord. So uh, anyway, as I say many times, just because I read somebody's Sunday sermon does not mean I agree with every word of it, and I sure as hell don't agree with that absurd, clueless moron statement. Uh, one and a half C has already gone out the window. But anyway, I, I just couldn't resist uh, getting back to Greta Thunberg. Saving the world is voluntary. You could certainly argue against that statement from a moral point of view, but the fact remains there are no laws or restrictions in place that will force anyone to take the necessary steps towards safeguarding our future living conditions on planet Earth. This is troublesome from many perspectives, not least because, as much as I hate to admit this, Beyonce was wrong. Beyonce was wrong. I, I mean, I don't know Beyonce. I don't know what she looks like. I don't know what her voice sounds like, but I'm taking a wild guess that everything out of Beyonce's clueless moron mouth is wrong. But I don't know. I mean, I don't know the woman. Uh, anyway, as much as Greta hates to admit it, Beyonce was wrong. It is not girls, it is not girls who run the world. The world is run by politicians, corporations, and financial interest, mainly represented by white, privileged, white, privileged, middle-aged, straight, CIS men. I have no clue what CIS means. Clueless, 
imbecilic, stupid men, I guess. C-I-S. Clueless, imbecilic, stupid men. And it turns out most of them are terribly ill-suited for the job, you know, of saving a planet. This may not come as a big surprise. After all, the purpose of a company is not to save the world. Huh, really? It is to make a profit. Or rather, it is to make as much profit as it possibly can in order to keep shareholders and market interest happy. That leaves us with our political leaders. Yes, they do have great opportunities to improve things, but it turns out that saving the world is not their main priority either. Well, do you think that the political leaders in the pocket of the global industrial corporatocracy has no more interest in saving a planet than the global corporate global corporatocracy with the global banksters behind it all. Anyway. Alright. Approaching the issues of climate and ecological crisis three times we have the climate and ecological crisis inevitably involves confronting numerous uncomfortable questions, taking on the role of being the one who tells the unpleasant truth and thereby risking one's popularity is clearly not on any politician's wish list. So they try to stay clear of the subject until they absolutely cannot avoid it any longer. Then they turn to communication tactics and PR to make it seem as if real action is being taken when the fact, when in fact the exact opposite is happening, well, or not happening as the case may be. It gives me no pleasure whatsoever to keep calling out the bullshit of our so-called leaders. I want to believe that people are good, but there really seems to be no end to their cynical games. If your objective as a politician truly is to act on the climate crisis, then surely your first step would be to gather accurate figures for our actual emissions to get a complete overview of the problem and from there start looking at real solutions? Hmm. That would also give you a rough idea of the changes needed, the scale of them, and how quickly they need to be put in place. This, however, has not been done or even suggested by any world leader, or to my knowledge, by any one single politician. <laughs> Journalist Alexandra Erzman Otto describes how she started investigating Swedish climate policies and found that only one third of our, meaning Sweden's, actual emissions of greenhouse gases were included in our climate targets and the official national statistics. The rest, meaning two-thirds, were either outsourced or hidden in the loopholes of international climate accounting frameworks. So, whenever the climate crisis is debated in my progressive home country, we conveniently leave out two-thirds of the problem. An investigation by the Washington Post has shown that this phenomenon is far more, un is far from unique to Sweden. Though the figures vary from case to case, 
this process and the overall mentality of constantly trying to sweep things under the carpet and blame others is the international norm. So when our politicians say that we must solve the climate crisis, we should all ask them which climate crisis they are referring to. Is it the crisis that contains all our emissions or the one that contains only a part of them? When politicians go a step further and accuse the climate movement of not offering any solutions to our problems, we should ask them what problems they are talking about. Is it the problem that is caused by all of our emissions or just by the ones they did not manage to outsource or hide in the statistics? Because these are completely different issues. It will take many things for us to start facing this emergency, but above, but above all, it will take honesty, integrity, and courage. So it's when I know when I am looking for three, for three uh, words to describe politicians, uh, corporations, and the banksters behind it all. I know that honesty, integrity, and courage are the three are the three adjectives that certainly uh, leap to my mind. Yes, <clears throat> the longer we wait to start taking the action needed to stay in line with our international targets, the harder and more costly it will get to reach them. The inaction of today and yesterday must be compensated for in the time that lies ahead. Yes. For us to have an even small chance of avoiding setting off irreversible chain, rea chain reactions far beyond human control, we need drastic, immediate, far-reaching emission cuts at the source. When your bathtub is about to overflow, you don't go looking for buckets or start covering the floor with towels. You start by turning off the tap as soon as you possibly can. Leaving the water running means ignoring or denying the problem, delaying doing anything to resolve it, and downplaying its consequences. So it sounds like that uh, Greta is agreeing with Julia that we need to just stop oil. Of course, if we just stop oil and fossil fuels, half the world would starve to death in the first growing season, which you can debate whether that is the morally thing to do, the appropriate thing to do, taking the planet from 8 billion to 4 billion in about three months is a good start. Anyway, back to Greta. Our politicians do not need to wait for anyone else in order to start taking actions. Well, they need to, they need to, wait for the corporate lobbyist and the banksters behind it all, you know, to, to pull their little puppet strings. They have to wait for that. Nor do they need conferences, treaties, international agreements, or outside pressure. They could start right away. They also have and have had for a long time endless opportunities to speak up and send a clear message about the fact that we must fundamentally change our societies. And yet, with very few exceptions, they actively choose not to. 
this is a moral decision that will not only cost them dearly in the future, it will put the entire living planet at risk. Oh, I thought that was the end, but no. Uh, Greta is on a roll. I'm just going to keep plowing ahead with this until my uh, camera collapses. I thought that was the end. Anyway, no. Greta has more on her mind. According to the United Nations Emissions Gap Report, the world's planned fossil fuel production by the year 2030 will be more than twice the amount that would be consistent with keeping to the one and a half C target. Here she goes again. Okay, Greta, one more time. The world's fossil fuel production has already completely obliterated any chance. Okay? Would you can the one and a half C crap? You're a big girl now, Greta. You're a big girl. Anyway, this is science's way of telling us that we can no longer reach our targets without a system change because meeting our targets would literally require tearing up, tearing up contracts, valid deals and agreements on an unimaginable scale. This should, of course, be dominating every hour of our everyday news feed, every political discussion, every business meeting, and every inch of our daily lives. But that is not what is happening. The media and our political leaders have the opportunity to take drastic and immediate action, and still they choose not to. Perhaps it is because they are still in denial. Maybe it is because they don't care. Maybe it is because they are unaware. Maybe it is because they are more scared of the solutions <clears throat> yep, than of the problem itself. Maybe it is because they are afraid of causing social unrest. Maybe they are afraid of losing their, their popularity. Maybe they simply did not go into politics or journalism to uproot a system they believe in, a system they have spent their entire lives defending, or maybe the reason for that inaction is a mixture of all those things. Sancho, would you come up here, please? Sancho. Sancho. Sancho is sitting out the rant, taking a sun bath. My little dog is enjoying his sun bath. We cannot live sustainably within today's economic system. Yet, that is what we are constantly being told we can do. We can buy sustainable cars, travel on sustainable motorways powered by sustainable petroleum. We can eat sustainable meat and drink sustainable soft drinks out of sustainable plastic bottles. We can buy sustainable fast fashion and fly on sustainable airplanes using sustainable fuels. And of course, we're going to meet our short and long-term sustainable climate targets too without making the slightest effort. How, you might ask, how can that be possible when we don't yet have any technical solutions that can fix this crisis alone 
and the option of stopping doing things is unacceptable from our current economic standpoint. Yeah, like half the planet starving to death in a few months. Some people find that unacceptable. I don't find it unacceptable, but some people do. I guess Greta Thunberg and Julia don't find it unacceptable to just let half the population of the planet starve to death. Hmm. That sounds very moral to me. Anyway, what are we going to do? Yes, Greta, what are we going to do? Well, the answer is the same as always. We'll cheat. We will use all those loopholes and all the creative accounting that we have conjured up in our climate framework since the very first conference, COP, I guess that's COP1 in 1995, years before Greta was a uh, glimmer in her daddy's eye. We will outsource our emissions along with our factories. We will use baseline manipulation and start counting out emission reductions when it suits us best. We will burn trees, forest, and biomass as those have been excluded from the official statistics. We will lock decades of emissions into fossil gas infrastructure and call it green natural gas. And then we will offset the rest with vague deforestation, with vague reforestation projects. Trees that might be lost to disease or fire while we simultaneously cut down the last of our old growth forest at a much higher speed. Now don't get me wrong, planting the right trees in the right soil is a great thing to do. It eventually sequesters some carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and we should do it whenever it is suitable for the soil and suitable for the people living there who care for that land. But reforestation should not be confused with offsetting our climate compensation because that is something completely different. You see, the main problem is that we already have at least 40 years of carbon dioxide emissions to compensate for. It is all up there in the atmosphere and that is where it will stay probably for many centuries to come. This historic CO2 is what we should be focusing on when we are using our present very limited ways of removing CO2 from the atmosphere in various projects such as planting trees. But offsetting as we have conceived it is not meant to do that. It was never created for us to clean up our mess. Far too often it has been used as an excuse for us to continue emitting CO2, maintain business as usual, and meanwhile send a signal that we have a solution and therefore we do not have to change. Words matter and they are being used against us. These are lies, dangerous lies. That will cause further disastrous delay. Predictions by the UN conclude that our CO2 emissions are expected to rise by another 16% by 2030. The time 
we have left to avoid creating increasing climate catastrophes in many places around the world is rapidly running out. Good Lord is Greta on a tear. It's now a race between Greta's tome and my battery. <clears throat> Good Lord, girl. You are on a tear. We are currently on track to have a world that is 3.2 C hotter by the end of the century. And that's if countries fulfill all the policies they have in place policies that are often based on flawed and underreported numbers, but in many cases they are nowhere near even doing, even doing that. We are, quote, seemingly light years away from reaching our climate action targets, close quote, to quote UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Yes. And there is also the matter of our previous track record of failure when it comes to delivering on all those non-binding pledges and promises. Let's just say it is not so impressive or convincing. Even if we carried out all of our climate action plans, we would still be in trouble. Net zero by 2050 is simply too little, too late. And of course, it's unadulterated horseshit. There is just too much at stake for us to place our destiny in the hands of undeveloped technologies. We need real zero. And we need honesty. At the very least, we need our leaders to start including all our actual emissions in our target statistics and policies. Before they do that, any mention of vague future goals is nothing but a distracting waste of time. They say that we should not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. But what exactly do we do when the good not only fails to keep us safe, but is also so far away from what is needed that it can only be described as comedy material? Very dark comedy, but still, yes, dark comedy material. No comment. <clears throat> anyway, they say we must be able to compromise as if the Paris Agreement were not already the world's biggest compromise, a compromise that has already locked in unimaginable amounts of suffering for the most affected people in areas. I say no more. I say Stand your ground. Our so-called leaders still think they can bargain with physics and negotiate with the laws of nature. They speak to flowers and forests and the language their quarterly income reports in the language of U.S. dollars and short-term economics, they speak to flowers and forests in the language of U.S. dollars and short-term economics. They hold up their quarterly income reports to impress the wild animals. They read stock market analysis to the waves of the ocean like fools. We are approaching a precipice, and I would strongly suggest that those of us who have not been greenwashed out of our senses stand our ground. Do not let them drag us another inch closer to the edge. Not one 
itch right here, right now, is where to draw the line. Amen. Saint Greta Thunberg. Greta and Julia are drawing the line. Yes, that was a fine way to kick off this absolutely gorgeous fall day. Now, what I need to do is go draw some lines up on the mountain about, uh, I'm going to go play God this morning and decide which of these trees I'm not going to cut down with my gas-sucking chainsaw when I go on my chainsawing rampage after the last leaves hit the ground. I highly suggest you get out there and go on a gas-sucking, chainsawing rampage while you still can. Bye, guys. Man, look at this gorgeous day. This little dog, are you enjoying your sunbath? Mm. So I will be heading to Vermont tomorrow uh, for three days. Not sure how many rants we're going to have between now and Thursday. So I am on the road to look at these gorgeous leaves. Well, I still can. My guys.